All right, now I'm here officially. So um, this might or may not be the last class. I don't know. Did uh, I think I think red classes? There's but I mean those I think they they may or may not meet in the during finals week. I can't remember. Um, do you did Marla say anything? Oh, the, 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 there was this presentation thing. Is that still on? Do you guys know? Uh, I'm going to talk to Marla right after they teach, actually, at 5.30. So I can we can coordinate on that. Um, but I, I'm not sure if, if we're still doing the presentation thing. OK. Um, but I don't know. Regardless, I mean, I can do a class next week. We'll see. OK, I'm happy to do one. Uh, certainly got more stuff that I could go over. OK, so let's see. I'll let you know. All right. Um, and uh, yeah. OK, so it seems like. Uh, how are we how are we doing with. Uh, Battle Royale, is that is that is that happening? Um, everything going well there. Did I? Let's see. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we can. Yeah. I mean, we. I'll write something. I. You have some questions. Okay. Let's hear them. Q bar. Q bar is Q over little Q over capital Q, normalized Q. Okay. Q bar is always zero. So you mean, because your policy function is going to tell you Z as a function. Oh, wait, you're thinking Q bar. What is Q bar? Oh, Q bar is, you know, Q bar is the Q dot is always, that could be, yeah. So let me think. So Q, Q bar is, Q hat dot is oh yeah okay um so Q bar is the the steady state value right so um the dynamics for Q are basically you innovate you capture a new product line you get some Q hat and then you can do your own innovation Z innovation okay. And other people are doing that, and that's pushing. I mean, there's overall growth, which is pushing capital Q up, and so that's pushing your Q hat down. Okay. Now it could be that you do. Um, it could be that you do innovation Z innovation. You can, so you can solve for Q bar with just parameters. Remember, if you look at the. In the notes, right? We we solve for we have that one equation characterizing Q bar. But basically, it could be that you do a Z innovation, but you're not actually you're still going down, right? It could be that you're doing some Z innovation, but then overall Q is still growing faster, and so you're just gonna like, um, like you'll get you'll get your new Q hat, and then you'll decrease until you hit Q bar, and then you just like coast there because remember Q Q bar is where you're coasting. You're 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 just keeping up with capital Q. All right, and then you, you might coast there, and then eventually someone kicks you out and innovates. Okay, so um, yeah, or you know, or they might kick you out before you even get to Q bar. That's another possibility. Okay, so um, yeah, that could be all right. Uh, that could be a thing, but um, what's that going to mean? That's going to mean that you're not going to see anyone below Q bar. Right, because Q bar is so Q bar is where you use your words, Jerry. Um, but I mean, use your whiteboard. So 
That was supposed to make a mark on the whiteboard, but it didn't. That's not cool. Uh, hold on. My like, I want, I want to have. Uh, my marker isn't working. Let me try and restart. My uh, oh, there we go. It's back. Okay. Um, okay, so think about, um, here's Q hat. Okay, and then, so well, yeah, we, we could plot, remember GZ, right? So GZ is, um, let me pull up the, the exact expression here. Where are you at? Okay, uh, so what is GZ? That uh, so that's well, okay. See, it, that's Q dot over Q, regular Q, right? Which is Z, okay. So um, yeah, I mean it's it's whatever it is, all right. So uh, G Z is is Q over Q. Remember Q dot coming from Z is uh, in this, you know, for this model that I wrote down here, it's Q to the alpha, capital Q to the one minus alpha. Okay, so then Q dot over Q is gonna be Z over Q hat. So the, the, so this is this is Z uh, Q, Q hat to the alpha minus one, which is, you know, that's like Z Q over Q hat to the one minus alpha. Okay, so, Q dot over Q is just going to be Z over Q to the Q hat to the one minus alpha. Okay, and this makes it so that if you put in the same amount of Z for a higher Q, it's harder to actually improve that technology that that creates uh, some bounding forces. Okay, you can't just do runaway growth. Okay, so um, maybe alpha zero. If alpha zero, you just get a Z over Q hat. That's that's nice. Okay, so then <clears throat> I mean, let, so let's say you know. Regardless of what Z actually is, remember Z itself is a function of Q hat. But even if Z was, let's say Z was constant and alpha was zero, you'd get like a one over Q kind of looking thing. Okay. All right. So let's say that that's what it, roughly, the Z was roughly constant and that uh, alpha was, was, it doesn't matter. You know, alpha is between zero and one. Okay. So you get this for your GZ. Now, we're also going to have some overall G. That's the growth rate of capital Q. Okay, so then let's say it looks like that. Okay, and there's some intersection point. So this is this is Q bar. This is Q bar. There we go. This is Q bar. Okay, so what I'm what I'm playing here is G Z, remember, is is Z a, a really of Q hat over Q hat to the one minus alpha. Okay, so um you put in some Z, but then higher Q means it's hard, it's it's more difficult to generate growth. Okay, now, well, um, you know, if you had like a constant, Z, roughly constant Z, yeah. So now think about it like this: if you start here, you're 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 just gonna sink down to Q bar. If 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 you have a product line that's here, okay, then you're gonna go up to Q bar. You're gonna grow relative to G until your until your Q bar hits Q, uh, Q hat hits Q bar. Okay, so you're, you're always going to converge to this point. So it's stable in that sense. But periodically, you get innovations that, you know, for instance, make you an, an X innovation that makes you jump up. Okay, or maybe you, you even happen, it happens before you hit Q bar. So you're going to get periodic bumps up by that factor lambda. Okay, and then otherwise, you're going to decay back down and then you get bumped. Now this is the, you also the, the product line is changing hands when that happens, but it's if you just look at the Q, it's just going to drift down, get bumped up, drift down, get bumped up, right? So that's going to give you some distribution. That's going to look like this is Q hat, and this is like I think yeah, you know, it probably looks something like this. Okay, it probably looks something like that. I don't know. I mean, I do know, but. Um, it, it could have a peak, you know, it, it depends really. 
it could it could you know for instance it could look like this okay so um but you're not going to see anything down here okay you're not going to see anything down here now it might be you're saying your g is always lower that means you're like you're you're easy yeah. so, so that you're saying it's like you solve for this whole thing like this and you got so i mean i would be surprised because you know what this one over q term yeah q bar should be bigger than zero and this one over q term should eventually kick you up here so either you know, maybe change your grid a little bit okay so that you you can capture that point um yeah okay uh So yeah, I mean, I I might I would say either change your grid or maybe fiddle around with the parameters a little bit. Um, but you wanna you wanna first so you can solve for q bar as a function of parameters. Remember, right? You know q bar from that equation that characterizes it in the functional forms that you use. Create your grid around q bar. Solve for q bar and then construct your grid so that q bar is guaranteed to be inside of it. Okay, and then you should get something reasonable here. That's what I would do. Give it like a healthy margin on each side, you know. Um, but that's that's what I would do. All right. Okay. So then, um, yeah. Okay. Now Yu Chung saying uh, when you solve for the HJB, that's the Hamilton Jacobi Bellman equation, the value function. DZ is too large for the high Q hats. You're saying they're getting negative flow profits? You can get negative flow profits. You can invest. You can do so much research that you... Well, actually, why would you do that, though? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, if, if you, it's plausible. It's conceivable that you would have negative flow profits so that in the future your Q was slightly higher than it otherwise would be, although it will still be lower, right? Because these Qs are drifting downwards here. But it's conceivable that you would do that just so you, you so you kind of partially arrest the, the fallen Q. Okay. Um, I don't, I don't think we can rule that out. I don't know what I got from my, when I was doing it. Um, so it's fine to get negative flow profits, right? You could have a value function. You could have, a value function that's negative. You can have flow profits that are always negative and you're just trying to like manage the, you're just trying to stem the losses, right? You know, like you're in jail and you're trying to like make the best that you can of it, right? It's not going to be great, but you can still write down a value function for that, right? Um, so it, it, negativity shouldn't be an issue. If your value function is blowing up, I'd look more at like a step size, lower your step size. Um, make sure you're not like doing negative discounting or negative rates or stuff like that. Okay. If you're getting blow ups, do that. And then also remember to do partial updating. When you get your updated value function, don't just assign that as the new value. Just assign like, just like go like 1% or 10% in that direction and slowly update so you don't go too wild. Okay. Um, those are the usual reasons for for this sort of problems. The other the other place it can show up is that you got to make sure you do the derivative right. Okay, you got to get that winding scheme right so you're going in the right direction. Okay. Um. Yeah. Let's. Uh. Well, you we want you guys keep working on that. If you have questions, we can fire up a Zoom ad hoc Zoom happy hour, happy hour, office hours, uh, or both. Um, initial guess, it can matter. It shouldn't be a huge deal as long as it's reasonable. You can just use the, what I do oftentimes is just use the flow profit at that point divided by the discount rate. So it's like, what if you just got that flow profit forever and you discount it at rate R row or whatever? Then, um, that's a good first guess.
you just don't move, right? So um, that should be fine. The the the, the actual guess, I honestly, in my experience, is not a is not the the generally not the decisive factor in 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 uh in these sorts of issues. Okay, um, so yeah, let's um. Yeah, let's do let's do a let's do an office hours later this week if you guys want to talk. Okay, I think maybe it seems like most everyone's kind of like it seems like we're we're drifting towards a later date here for for handing in. I don't know. Uh, if you so if, I mean if you just keep working on it, right? If you want to, um, and uh, let me know how things go. Okay, and um, and then we can if you want to do a office hours, just we can do, we can hop on Zoom for that too. Okay. Um, at some point I'll just call it and say, let's, let's, let's hand these in. And then, uh, uh, I'll, I'll like post my code and we can think about that. Okay. Um, but I think for, we're good for now. Okay. Um, all right. So let's talk about, uh, talk, let's talk about some of that machine learning stuff okay now we started on this last time okay i got some got some code that i'll show you at some point um but first let's go over the, the conceptual issues um i'm going to show you some code it's going to be like tensorflow keras if you've heard of that um style okay and then if we have time various examples uh if we have time uh, at the end, I'll talk about this other library called Jax, which is like a slightly lower level version of TensorFlow. Um, and then, yeah, I imagine we'll be out of time at that point. Okay, so so the last time we uh, we're talking about neural networks. Okay, and we had we we said we had basically arrived at the fact that well, essentially your neural network is going to look like Y. Should I write? I don't know. I'll, I'll write F. Y is some function of your weights vector product x plus a b this stands for bias okay uh, and this function could be a couple different things could be the sigmoid could be the rectified linear unit boom uh could be linear um could be hyperbolic secant or something it's like i don't know could be a lot of things, right? But usually it's like one of these three things. So this is like sigmoid, also known as softmax, I think. Those be, those might be slightly different, but they're, they're both the same shape. This is rectified linear unit. This is linear. Okay, so that F, that, and that's F, for any of these Fs, okay? So you're, you're, you're passing your input data, which is a vector, Multiplying up by a matrix of weights W uh, and adding on a, a vector of biases, which is the same size as the input. Okay, um, so like, uh, which is to say that X is n by k. I guess I, I just X is n by k. K is the number of like regressors, if you will, n is the number of, of data points. n is either the total number of data points. In practice, it's going to be the batch size. So you can't put the entire data set. We're in big data land here. You cannot put the entire data set into this thing at once. It'll explode, OK, even if you have a kick-ass GPU, right? So you need to put it in there in batches, because k could be in the millions, right? So you need to put there in batches. So this might be the batch size, too. But it's some, some number of units, OK? Uh, w. Okay, so I guess I'm okay. Now I might need to put in some transposes here in a second. Um, so at the end of the day, let's say we want to get out column vectors. Okay, so then W should be. We want to get out things that are size n. So let's say that this is one by k. Let me decide if that's right. And then uh, B, I actually want that to be K. I want it to be K by one. Okay, we're gonna get column vectors. No, 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 no. 
Okay, let me think. We want to get out n by 1. The weight should be size k. The weight should be size k. So I might have, might have to do some some backtracking here. Okay, so if, so if we want to get something, so it should be size k. Let's say that those are k by one. Okay, and then these this is this is just going to be one dimension one. Okay, um, so then here we would want x w I guess. Okay, so we're going to do x w. So that'll that'll give you an n by one. Okay. And then you got this bias, which you apply to each each one separately, and then you output this this uh, n by one. So then y is n by one. Okay. So, um, yeah, I just yeah, I just wanted to make sure you get the the dimensions right. So then x w is going to give you an n by one. Add on that bias, and then you get out the same thing. Okay. So, but but at the at the unit of one single observation, okay, you have, you know, k different regressors, okay? You multiply that by your, your your weights, which are like your betas in a regression, right? And you sum them up, so that's your vector product there, okay? And then you add on some intercept term, which is called a bias in this case, okay? So you if you want to think this uh, about this as a regression, these are your betas, this is your intercept term, beta zero, okay? And these are your betas, and you're, we're just doing this in a full matrix form, okay, with all, all of these at once, okay? And then f is a function. I mean, f operates pointwise. It operates on each one individually. It doesn't crisscross them in any particular way, okay? There's no interaction terms across uh, units of observation. That's almost always true in this setting, okay? So that's your, that's your neuron, okay? Okay, everything after that is just different combinations of neurons with different Fs and stuff like that. Okay, so the, the standard one would be you have uh, some input. Okay, and then um, you send that off to say, in this case, let's just say three different neurons. Okay, so these neurons are characterized by, you know, W1, B1. W2, B2, by their weights and biases for each one. Okay. Um, and so, you know, they're picking up different things. Okay. So, remember, so this is like you're sending out your K regressors, okay, to each one. And um, these are taking those K regressors and mapping them into like one. Okay, uh, one number per unit of observation, and then you're combining those at the end with another neuron. Okay, so this is taking it from three to one. This is three to one. I guess I should really, you know, this is like, this is like k to one. Okay, and this is just your input. Okay, and at the end of the day, you get out something. This could be more than one, but let's just say it's one. Okay, it's a unit. It's a one-dimensional number, basically. Okay, so that's like a that's like a simple neural network with one hidden layer. Okay, and your parameters are each of these weights and biases. Okay, so it would be um, three times k plus one for the hidden layer. Okay, and then you have uh, basically four parameters here: three weights and one bias. Okay, so whatever. Yeah, that can get big if k is large. Okay. Um, all right. So that's, that's, that's like a simple neural network. Okay. Now, um, there are a bunch of ways that we can, we can combine these. Okay. Um, all right. And I guess I'll go over the most important ones. Okay. So I'll, I'll go over kind of network structure uh, first, and then we can talk about Sort of actual design decisions we can talk about how do you estimate these and everything like that okay and what's your objective okay but first let's just talk about 
how can you make a network, right? Um, and maybe I should, I don't want to put the card ahead of the horse here. Okay. Maybe I should talk about how you do it for, for the simple network and then we'll build it up from there. Okay. So, um, all right. So what, what inputs do we, what do we, we, we still kind of need stuff to, to do it. What would we call an estimation here? Okay. So we need, we want to estimate these parameters. Okay. And well, what's our objective? Okay. So generally we need an objective function. Okay, now this is, um, often it's gonna be something very much looking like a maximum likelihood kind of thing, or the objective function will be the log likelihood, for instance, okay? And that, that's what I, actually, I went over, I, I, I now I remember, I went over the likelihood for um, the logistic regression case, right? So that's that would be your, your categorical, what would they call categorical cross entropy? Okay, that's one. Um, but but in general, I mean, if if, if like if you're doing a, a linear regression with um, Gaussian error terms, independent Gaussian error, then you're so you know uh, so linear regression, independent Gaussian error. That's going to be basically your mean squared error. Okay. Mean squared error is going to be your objective. Why? Because the the uh, PDF for Gaussian, you know, looks something like you know minus one over two sigma squared times x squared. Okay, so that log likelihood is is going to be related to like like a minus x squared, with sigma is just a constant at that point, right? So your log likelihood looks like minus x squared. You sum that over all your uh, observations. That's sum of squared. Okay. And then you can take the mean, it doesn't matter. That's that's the scaling factor. Okay. So so you know with linear regression, Gaussian error is mean squared error is your likelihood, and that's what you would use here. You would call it mean squared error. So they just call it whatever it is, not what it comes from. Okay. Um okay, then logistic. Okay, so this is like these are like cases, not implications. Uh you know, logistic. We went over that. Um, that gives you categorical cross entropy. Okay, that gives you a, a particular sum of like the observations times the log, the probabilities, and so on. That one, that one's more complicated, you know. But like we, we derived it in the last the last class. Okay. Um. But but really, any categorical thing, right? Where you have that kind of categorical predictions, it's going to look like logistic regression. It's going to look, I mean, what's happening underneath might be much more complicated, but once you get here, you're going to spit out a probability, right? You're going to spit out a probability of, of being of class one or two or whatever. Okay. So to get more specific, you know, in this case, let's say you had this neural network. Okay. And you spit out, um, you're just going to spit out some real number. Okay. Now that's not necessarily a probability. Okay. I mean, what, what you should really do is, is ensure that you have a sigmoid on the end here. Okay. In which case you're going to get something between zero and one. Okay. So you spit out, you just make sure you at the end, you put, you, you have a sigmoid activation. These are, this is called activation that F, this f up here is, is called the activation function. Okay, so um, you get a number between zero and one. That's your probability. You can put that into a categorical cross entropy sort of thing. Okay, now what it okay, so that's that's the binary case where you're classifying is this the thing or is it not? Okay, there's also the the um, multi class. Uh, Categorization. So, the prime example is you you you, you want to categorize uh, pictures of peop of handwritten digits, okay, into the classes zero, one through nine, okay. Um, 
you know, you have 10 possible classes there. Okay. So in that case, usually what you do is, so if you, if you just run, if you were to, so in that case, actually your, your output would be 10 dimensional. Okay. Um, you'd want to predict probabilities for each of the classes, basically. But you also want those to sum to one. Okay. So, so what you'd really do is, is, um, you'd have 10, uh, real numbers. Okay. And then you'd send them through this sort of exponential map. Okay. So this, this is like PI is equal to this thing, right? So this is guaranteed to, to sum the one because we're normalizing. Um, it's uh, between zero and one, right? Because the, the XI is also in here. Okay, it's positive. It's increasing in XI, okay? It's got all the, all the good stuff, right? So you would send it through this logistic map, okay? Uh, before put in here into your, your uh, categorical cross entropy, okay? The other thing you could do is, is, is actually just analytically or you run through the algebra of mapping directly from the XIs into your categorical cross entropy because you are taking logs there. And that actually is, is the, the way that they do it underneath. But like conceptually, you get real numbers, you map them into probabilities that are guaranteed to, to sum the one across all the classes. Then you put that in your, uh, your categorical cross entropy objective. Okay, so... Um, yeah, so that's that's the other primary type of objective. There's other stuff, you know. There's uh, you could do the Poisson objective, okay? Um, if you have count data, you know, you're trying to. So this this is this this is stuff that looks like if you've seen generalized linear models before, right? So a generalized linear model is gonna model the log of say that Poisson parameter pi as some, you know, uh, potentially more complicated type of, of process here. Okay. Um, it's going to model the log of that Poisson rate as a linear thing, but then the outcome is, you know, YI is distributed like Poisson with uh, full parameter or rate parameter PI, right? You see, so like you model the rate parameter, but then the actual outcome and hence your likelihood is is a Poisson distribution okay now, you because know, the reason we have the log is because the rate has to be positive this ensures that the rate is positive because pi is e to the whatever this thing is okay so that's like that's a glm basically but also you can effectively implement a glm by just saying for your objective function use the Poisson likelihood okay and that's built all of these are built into keras and any any ML framework worth its salt, these are built in. You just give them to it by name. You don't even have to define them. Okay. Um, okay. So that's that's sort of what you can do in terms of matching output data. You've got continuous data. You got count data. You got categorical data. Those are the three biggies. Anything after that, and there's nothing after that. Okay. So, um, yeah. Now, okay. So th those are your objective functions. Okay. Now we want to actually maximize this. All right. And um, here's where we need to, you, know, you want to understand what's going on underneath a little bit. So let's do that. Okay. So um, you got your various frameworks. You got TensorFlow. You got Torch. That's the Facebook one. This is Google. That's Facebook. Okay. Now under underneath there's a, there's Keras that used to be independent, then it got subsumed into to TensorFlow. That's a the higher level API for TensorFlow. Okay. Torch doesn't, they kind of have both built into one kind of thing, right? Um, there are others out there, but I don't think these are the two main ones. I think this, these are the best. Okay. So uh, I'm gonna the examples I'm gonna do are in TensorFlow, okay? But but the 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 idea is similar, okay, which is that you're kind of constructing, you're constructing this neural network symbolically, okay? In the sense that you're creating a system of functions, like Python functions, 
that compute the value. Like you're, you're literally creating uh, functions that compute these values. Okay. Then what, what these frameworks are doing is kind of sending through, sending the numbers through and computing stuff. Okay. But also they're computing gradients at the same time. There, there, there is a method. So it's called like automatic differentiation. Okay. There's forward and backward mode. We're using forward mode here. Generally You're using this type of automatic differentiation to find the derivatives kind of symbolically. Okay, depending on how you define symbolically. But what matters for us is it's automatic. We don't have to think about it at all. Okay. All we do is construct the neural network and say find the derivative for me. Okay. So um yeah, that's cool. Uh and so you got this likelihood function. You can calculate the value, but you can also calculate the gradient to the likelihood function for every parameter. It doesn't matter if there are a million parameters, you can do it. Okay, and it's gonna be fast. All right, so that's good. So you're gonna get um for a given set of parameter values, and those are your B, your weights and your biases, basically, whatever they may look like, um, you're gonna get a likelihood, or like a, a, this like log likelihood, which we call lowercase l, okay? And then you're gonna get a gradient, g. Now the gradients, whatever, how many parameters you have, big. It's a big vector, okay? And uh, yeah. And so what do you do? Well, it's kind of, you know, boneheadedly simple, which is you just move where the gradient's positive. Okay, so the gradients, let's say, um, okay, so the, are we maximizing likelihood? Yes. Are we minimizing negative likelihood? Yes. Um, oftentimes uh, in engineering, they like to minimize things, okay? So we're gonna we're gonna minimize minus likelihood minus of the likelihood. Now, if you're minimizing things, you want to like if you're minimizing a function and you look left, and the gradient's positive, you want to go right, and vice versa. Okay, so so essentially, what you're gonna do. Let's say that theta is your big set of parameters. Okay, then um, you want to, and let's say like we have like theta t plus one should be theta t plus some eta, which is like a step size factor. Okay. Now, okay, so let's think. If you, the gradient tells you if you increase the function, how much does that thing go up? Okay. So if, if, if the gradient is positive, if you increase that parameter, the function goes up, then you actually want to decrease the parameter to minimize. Okay. So it's a backwards kind of logic from uh, maximization. So we're going to do like G T. Okay. So G T is the gradient you get when you evaluate at theta T. Okay. So we're going to move away from that. Now this is a vector equation. Eta is just a number. G T is a vector. Theta is our vectors. Okay. So this is our updating rule for uh, this thing, which is, this is called gradient descent. Okay, gradient descent, because you descend in the direction of the gradient, or the opposite of the gradient. Okay, so that's what we got. Now, that'll work okay. All right, uh, that, that, that's that's just the starting point. Okay, there's many different implementations, variations on this. Okay, that'll work okay, maybe. In practice, we're not actually going to use something so simple. Okay, Um So now there's two, let's, let's, okay, let's, there's two considerations I want to work through. One is, can we improve this? Because it doesn't always work so well. And two is, uh, what was two? Two is, um, what happens when we can't do this for the whole data set at once? Okay. Because let's, let's do the, let's do the whole data set at once issue. Our data set generally is going to be n, size n, all right? But if n is really large, we can't compute this whole thing at once, okay? And what does that mean? Remember, the likelihood in general is defined as what if you think about the likelihood of observing the entire data set conditional on your x values. So it's conditional likelihood, conditional on your x values. What's the probability of 
likelihood observing y conditional on x values and conditional on your parameters. Okay, the x values are always the same, so it doesn't matter. Now, that's your full likelihood. If you can't put the whole data set into memory at once and evaluate the likelihood and everything, then you can't calculate the full likelihood at once, okay? So <clears throat> there's kind of, well, let me think. There's two options. One is you can go through and calculate it for each batch. So when you, when you break it up, that's called the batches and there's a batch size B, I'll call it, all right? Okay, or mini batches sometimes they're called. So you have these batches, you break it up, you can go through and calculate that likelihood contribution from each batch and then sum that up at the end, okay? That's one option, okay? The only issue with that is that you, you don't move your theta as fast, okay? You wait until you have the whole likelihood and then you move theta. The other option is you can move it with each batch, right? Now each batch, you get different data, you get a different kind of random sample of the data, and so it might kind of mislead you slightly, right? And it's going to be noisier, okay? So that, doing it batch by batch then is called stochastic gradient descent because because the what's stochastic is which specific, specific set of data you're getting with each batch, okay? So, but, but so, so you're going to get, you know, a little bit of noise happening there, but you're still going to go in roughly the right direction, the hope is, okay? So that's stochastic gradient. That's got, that's, Sometimes you'll see SGD, that's a big thing, okay? So, um, and you can do that here. Just with each batch, you get a GT, follow that yellow brick road, okay? Now, so that's that's the issue with batching, okay? It's not a huge deal, actually. Um, for, for us, I think, yeah, it shouldn't be a huge deal, okay? The other thing is, can we make this better? This updating rule, can we make it better? Okay, so there's there's a bunch of stuff that's out there. Okay, um, one one that's become pretty popular is called RMS prop. I assume for root mean square propagation or something like that. Okay, um, so this is there's this guy Jeffrey Hinton. He's kind of a big deal. He's a U Toronto in uh, the ML field. Um, he's invented a bunch of stuff. In particular, him and his team. Created or kind of proposed this thing called dropout, which we're going to talk about later on. Okay, um, but also this is RMS prop, which he didn't even write a paper on it. It was just like in one of his lectures, and it became popular. Okay, so things move quickly sometimes in this field. Um, so uh, what is RMS prop? Okay, so RMS prop is basically like you're, you're not quite doing this update. The problem with this is that like first of all, you need to figure out what is ADA. I mean, how do you choose ADA? There's a scaling, there's all sorts of scaling issues. You might go go crazy and like jump way off the other side of the space one time and then the other direction the other time and like, you know, or you might just move really slowly and it's like, like you know where you're going but the algorithm can't figure it out. Like as a human, you know, you just want to like overshoot but it goes too slow. So it's like, you would really want like an adaptive ADA effectively, okay? So that's what we're going to do, all right? So with RMS prop, you're basically tracking the root mean squares uh, like an MA style of moving average style of um, uh, like the past periods. Okay. So you're going to define what we're going to call like the expectation or RMS of G squared. Okay. Um, P. What does P mean? Problem. Hug you. What's up? I'm seeing it. Okay. Well, just let me know what's going on there. I'm going to keep rolling here. So this uh, expectation of G, this is at time. Let's call it like T plus one. Okay. And then uh, how do we do this? So, so you want to do a weighted average with gamma of the previous value. Okay. At T plus one minus gamma times uh, actual Oops, not Q. Actual GT squared, the one you just got. Okay, let's and Hinton suggests gamma equals 0.9. Okay, so um, which is heavy on the past, right? So this is a long-looking kind of average. Okay, now um, okay, so then so this is going to be um, the moving average of past gradients. 
it gives you a basis. So you're saying you're going to compare it to the past moving average. Did it go like way up or way down? And like, what's the average scale for this particular parameter? Because different parameters have like a characteristic scale, you know, and, and some of that you can control, but it's like, it, it, it doesn't matter in some sense. Okay. You just want to know the right direction to go. Okay. So, um, what's your update rule going to be? Okay. Now you're going to do theta T plus one is theta T minus, you're still going to base it off of GT and you're going to have this eta, which can slightly different interpretation there. And then you're going to divide by, uh, this thing here, this moving average at T and then plus some epsilon just so things don't go haywire. Okay. So that's where you're going to get. So effectively your adaptive eta is this new eta divided by some RMS. So the reason is RMS is that this is the, this is the, the backward looking moving average of this, this sum of squares. And this is the root. So you, this is sort of an RMS kind of thing. That's why it's RMS prop. Okay. So then you do this, you, you keep track of this RMS to, to get an adaptive eta that's parameter specific. Okay. And then you move around in your space. Okay. This also guarantees that this thing's never going to move farther than eta in a particular step. That's good. Okay. Because you don't want to, yeah. Especially if you got stuff that you don't want to go negative, you don't want to move too fast. Okay. So, so this is kind of cool. All right. And, and effectively you can think about it. Like, um, if you think about like, what's think about what's the gradient that you get. Okay. And, and then like, what's your step size, you know, Delta theta or whatever of T. Okay. Um, it's kind of like, like in the long run, sort of, it's kind of like a sigmoid. Okay. So it's like you, you kind of move around in here, but then there are limits to how far you're going to move. Okay. That are set like whatever, uh, by this is basically eta and minus eta. Okay. So there are limits and then it's responsive in the interim. Okay. So that, that's the basic idea. And there should, I mean, it should actually be minus this because of the minus sign. But yeah. All right. So, um, all right. Cool. Now, and then square root's actually going to make this fairly steep. This is going to be fairly steep. Okay. Um, okay. So that's RMS prop. RMS prop is pretty good. I like it. Um, it's, it comes to fall Keras, and I and I see a lot of the people out there using it too. So um, I think it's pretty good. Uh, okay. The cool thing is you don't have to actually do that in yourself. You just say RMS prop for the, uh, optimizer. Okay. There's others. There's Ada grad Adam. There's like 50 other ones. Okay. But I like RMS prop. Okay. So that's all right. That's the, you got stochastic creating and you got the various improvements like RMS prop, you got batches. Okay. Um, you got various objective functions. Those are all important ingredients into what we're doing here. Okay. Um, so I think, I mean, at this point, I, I think at this point I'm going to look, start looking at some code. Okay. So we've gone over kind of like the, the basic pipeline. Okay. And at least up to like the, the sort of simpler neural network stuff. Okay. So let's go to some code and see how that works out practice and how we implement it. Okay. Cause at the end of the day, you got to get your hands dirty here and start doing stuff. Okay. So let's do that. Um, there was a question of, did you guys have a question about the battle Royale stuff? It's what something looked like. I mean, it should be, I'm gonna see if I have a graph of anything in particular. So like this is, this might be old though. Maybe that, that's my Q distribution. So this is saying, yeah, actually, you know what? I'm seeing what, for me, actually, I, I was getting it. It's, it's it's negative everywhere, which I think is actually possible. So
What did I get? I forget what I got for Q bar though. Um, let me see how I. What did I do with Q bar? Yeah, I don't care. Remember. Okay, I'll, I need to think about that. But let's 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 concentrate on the ML stuff for now. Okay, so all right, so we want to we want to implement something. Okay, uh, yeah, I'll 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 look into that that, that issue. Hug you. Um, we're still yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, so let let's do let's do the ML stuff. Okay. Um, so this is this is Jupyter Notebook. Okay, and uh, first, should I? I'll just run this stuff in real time. Living on the edge here. Okay, let's we're gonna restart it. Okay, and then uh, maybe I'll. How do I make stuff bigger? Like this. Okay, let's do that. That's pretty big. Um, so let's run this. Okay, so this is just like, um potting stuff all right and then it's, it's includes seaborn seaborn's like a slick uh potting library that sits on top of matplotlib okay and then in terms of stuff we're going to import from tensorflow so first you want to install tensorflow when you're if you're doing this at home um tensorflow will run on your cpu of any sort okay within reason um it also if it can runs on on gpu uh you have to have like a sufficiently good GPU that'll speed stuff up, but it's not like it's not the end of the world if you if you're just doing stuff on CPU. Okay, so um, so we import TensorFlow base, import Keras, which is this high level API to TensorFlow. It's quite quite good. Uh, layers is just like a convenience the Keras layers and then the back end. Okay, layers is these different neural network layers that you can have. Okay, so uh, so let's do let's just do linear regression first. Okay, we're just gonna do simple linear regression. Okay, and so with linear regression, that's just um, that's just one of those you know x uh, w x plus b. That's a linear regression, and then our activation is just nothing. It's just the identity. Okay, that so when you have a identity activation with a single cell neural single neuron neural network, that's linear regression, okay? Um, and especially if you use the root mean squared error, because then you have that exact likelihood, okay? So that's the simplest possible thing you could do, okay? So we're going to define some stuff here. Um, and so we're going to have a million data points. K is 100, so we have 100 regressors. And I'm going to have a batch size of 128. So each batch is 128 by 100. So it's um, 10,000, you know, or 128,000. Uh, 12,800, I guess. Yeah, 12,800. That's actually not very big. Okay, so, um, and then there are a lot of batches per this, probably 7,813 batches per the whole data set. Okay, so the way that it works is that, you know, your bat, my, the batch size is 128, it'll calculate, you can see down here. That's the reason I know that. It's not because I'm smart, but because I just read this. That means there's 7,813 7, um, batches per data set each run through the data sets called an epic as in like e-p-o-c-h not e-p-i-c it's called an epic okay so and you just tell it how many epics to do okay so let's do that um define these things here we want to generate some data okay we want to generate realistic data that we can fit okay so here i'm, I'm giving it a properly specified model okay um and so what do we need well okay we need the coefficients beta so here I'm just saying beta is just like go from zero to k minus one and divide by k. So it's just a, a grid from zero to one, basically. So these aren't huge coefficients. There's stuff between zero and one, and I just did it in order. Okay. And there's a hundred of them. So it's each percentile. Okay. X, just totally random unit normal n by k. No need to do anything else. Okay. Uh, epsilon also random. So the epsilons are pretty big compared to the variation in X which I think is going to give us, you know, somewhat noisy estimates, but we also have a million data points. So, you know, take that. Um, and then we need to generate Y. Okay. Now here, 
two things. One, in Jupiter Lab, you can put in uh, Greek letters, which I love because it just seems so wrong, but so right. Uh, so you can do like, if you type beta and then just press tab, boom, you got a beta. Okay, so I like that. Um, so we have the betas, we have the x's, we have the epsilon. So that's actually a bare epsilon. And then, uh, and then we wanted to find y. The other thing I like now, this is new with, I think, Python 3.5 or so, uh, is this, uh, they, they have a matrix multiply operator. Okay, so you can just do like matrix multiplication with the at symbol. Okay, so x is n by k, beta is, beta is just k, but it's, it's it kind of implicitly it figures out that it's it's k by one, okay? So you multiply these together and you get an n by one column vector, and then you add that also this sort of implicitly assumed to be a column vector, you add those together. So you run this and then boom. Okay, so that takes a second because there's 100 million, 200 million so numbers being generated, but um, yeah. Uh, I like the at, the at notation is like, that's a lifesaver. I love it. Okay. So, um, yeah, that's what we got. Um, now that would generate our data is a big giant matrix. Okay. And now we want to interface with, uh, TensorFlow and we're going to do that through Keras. All right. So we need to define some things, which is essentially just the components of, of that type of network that I showed you before. Essentially, you need an input notion. You need to tell like, what does your input look like? Okay, that's the first line here. Here we're saying, um, it's not a math if it doesn't use obscure and confusing symbols. Exactly. And now we can do that even in a programming language, thanks to the power of Unicode. So yeah, and if you have Adam, the editor, uh, where'd you go, Adam? Um, I use Adam. I don't know if you guys are into, you know, fancy text editors or code editors, but I, I like Adam. Some people like Visual Studio Code. That, e that even runs on Linux, which I appreciate, but um, I like Adam. But but if you use Adam, there's a package called like uh, LaTeX Completions, which you can do the same thing. Okay, so you can do it everywhere. All right. Um, yeah, so so uh, inputs, you need to tell what the inputs look like. So we're saying this is just a layer called an input layer, just kind of handles all that stuff. You just need to tell it the shape, okay? Now, the cool thing about Keras is that you can, you only tell it stuff, generally speaking, unless you're getting, unless you're doing something funky, you only have to tell it stuff at the observation level. So you're saying the shape input is K and it'll figure out, okay, well, also there's an N on the front. You just tell it the tail end, it'll figure out N or like whatever the batch size is implicitly. Okay, so you tell it stuff at the unit of observation level. Okay, so we have K regressors, that's it. If it was an image, you'd give it like K comma K, right? That it's a K by K image, right? And then implicitly, then there's an N dimension on the front. So, or if it, well, later on we'll see it's a text, it's gonna be the length of the text times the number of, well, actually, yeah, potentially by the, the number of possible words, right? Remember we, we had the, you know, a, a, it depends on how you do it, but sometimes you'll get multiple dimensions. We'll, we'll get there, okay? So that in this case though, we just have K inputs. Now, this, this is like the simplest possible thing you can do in Keras. Outputs is gonna be a dense layer. So dense means that it's totally connected, that every input, uh, maps to every output in the sense of um, here. So like every K, like, like really, I guess I should have written, you know, there's K inputs here. So let's say K is three. So this is, this is our input layer. Then there's, there's three like real inputs. Really this is, the dense layer is saying all of these inputs map into every intermediate one. So this is our, still here. That factors in there, that factors in there. One factors in three, so does this one, so does that one. So obviously it blew up, but it's just a dense layer where everything feeds into everything. So here you'd have nine. Each of these would have three weights with a bias, but you have nine like pos like nine crisscrossing lines going on. Okay. Um, that's a dense layer. So in, in our case, okay, 
we're going to have k inputs, all right, and one output. Okay, so so actually, you know, it's not going to be so terrible. It's just going to have k lines, all right, which is just you're summing up those k's, and then each of these is our these are our betas or our w's, w slash beta. Okay. Okay, so that's what this looks like. So you're saying create a dense layer with you have to give it the output size. It'll figure out the input size based on how you you incorporate into the network, but you have to tell it where you're going. Are you going to output? If we had a hidden layer, we'd have like you know the number of hidden units. Okay, I'm um, sorry. We'd have the number of hidden units um, here. So so what the saying is, take layers and create a dense layer with output size one. Okay, because our output is just a one dimensional real Y thing. Um, and that's that's going to map from something into a w one unit, okay? And then we're saying, and then you you this this actually this thing here, this piece of code here, will give you a function, which is the layer. The layer is a function, and it's going to operate on the previous layer, right? So that's why I'm saying we're we're constructing is functionally because you take inputs, then you create a, a layer which is a function, and you operate on that previous layer, the inputs. And then you, if you have multiple, more than two layers, then you, you have them all chained together. Okay, so we'll see that in a bit. Um, so so you operate on the inputs and then um, that, yeah, I can see your outputs. So here it's just input output, but it'll be more complicated later. Um, now, now we need to create the model. Okay, so we've created the network. Okay, the model is just a wrapper around the network saying, okay, here's the input points, here are the output points. And it's like an interface to do stuff. Okay, so to create the model, which we're going to call model, you caris dot model, and you just tell it what are your input vectors. In this case, it's just inputs is this thing inputs here, and then the outputs are these outputs. So the fact that it's like inputs equals inputs, like if I had called inputs like you know um, x, I would do inputs equals x, right? And if I called outputs y, I'd do outputs equals y. But this is a symbolic notion. Right, because at this point we haven't used any data, right? Inputs is just a symbolic input point. We're gonna plug data into there in a bit. Outputs is a symbolic output points. We're gonna plug output data into there in a minute. Okay, so but so everything here is symbolic. We create a symbolic model of like Python code. All right, now and then we want to compile it so that this is where all the magic happens. Okay, but we need to tell it. What's our optimizer? We're using our favorite RMS prop, okay? Loss, mean squared error, MSE. We just give these as strings, okay? You can give it functions too. You could give it a loss function, right? But if you give it a string, it'll it'll pull it from a, a dictionary of commonly used uh, loss functions, okay? So you could put Poisson in here or something like that. Uh, the metrics is stuff that it'll, it'll give you updates along the way, how we doing. So usually you, you'd have for a classification of like accuracy or mean squared error, but we already have mean squared error because that's objective. You can do mean absolute error. I just wanted to do something. Mean absolute error is the, the average of the absolute value of the error instead of the average of the square, okay? Um, yeah, so that's your model, you've compiled it. What So what compile does is potentially a lot because underneath, um, let's see, underneath, TensorFlow lies XLA, I believe, which is like some language, intermediate language kind of thing, uh, which can exist either on the CPU or on the GPU, and you have different implementation details for each of those, and you need to be adaptive. There's a lot going on there. It'll optimize stuff. It'll compile it, pre-compile pre stuff. There's a, a lot going on. We don't need to worry about that. I don't even know what it is exactly. I have inklings, but not. I don't really understand it truly. So, it'll 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 work its magic though. Okay. Um, and then you you get your compiled model. Now, uh, let's see. So maybe we should. I mean, I guess I should separate the fit from the definition. So here we've defined the model. We've defined the network, and the model is like a a full wrapper for that. Now you can you can always do model that summary. That'll tell you what's up with the model. Okay, so this is going to take a second. Okay, so this gives you a full rundown of what your model's doing. Very simple here, but in, later on it'll have multiple rows here showing it's each individual uh, layer. Okay, so here we have an input layer of shape. So this 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 outer thing is saying we have one input. 
in general, you can have multiple inputs. I could have, you know, some text data, maybe some geographic data that's also linked with that and, and put it all together. Okay. So in general, you can have a lot of different types of data. That's this outer list here. And then the inner list is telling the shape of this thing. So it's none by hundred. So this means we already told it that K is hundred, that, 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 uh, number of progressors basically. This is saying none is like whatever you need it to be. Is it the whole data set? Is it the batch size? Doesn't matter. At this point, it doesn't know because we haven't given it any data. Um, and then uh, the dense layer, it maps from, well, let's see. So the, the output shape, again, none, the, the, the size of the data set times one, where we have this one output, okay? And then it says the number of parameters, and this is exactly what we expect. You're mapping from 100 regressors, so you got 100 betas, but then also you have the intercept. Right, so here this, the intercept is kept separate. You, so usually, when you do like a regression in in another package, it, you you like add the intercept of the data as a column of ones, and then it's just another beta. Here, the intercept is thought of somewhat separately. Okay, so so you have a hundred one parameters, much like the movie hundred one Dalmatians. Okay, um, all right, so that's our network total, and then it sums it up at the end. Trainable total params one hundred one, trainable params one hundred one. Non-tradable param is stuff you you fix if you want to fix it for some reason. That's not not common. Okay. Um, all right. So now what we're going to do is model fit. We need to give it data. So we're going to give it x and y data. So x. Now order here is important. When we told it inputs, x is going to map into those inputs, and y is going to map into the outputs. If we had given it a list of like text data, map data, statistical data, then we'd give it a list here too. That had to have the same order so it knows where to match up with which same for y okay yep and then uh, then we tell the batch size b which is 128 and the number of epochs how many times you go through the data that's going to be three okay so let's run this baby this is going to give it doesn't really matter what this returns so don't worry about it it's some object of gives you the history okay so we're we're running this okay you can see the loss that's the mean squared error started about seven it's pretty high actually it's going down and the mean absolute error is one okay we'll see but that's probably it's, you don't understand what the scale is and neither, neither do i really but it's going down that's important okay um now the <clears throat> we have error we're never gonna get that loss that mean squared error to zero because we have epsilon error we can't predict that okay I have noticed that it often goes exactly to one in these simple examples. I think there must be some, I think it's, I mean, I'm choosing my variance as one. I think, yeah, there's there gotta be some formula for that. And I, I just happen to often just have a unit variance. So um, you can see it's already basically converged. It's not moving around. So, yep, but let's run it. So it ran three epics. So it, it, it went through, you know, 24,000 batches of size 128 or equivalently 3 million data points. Okay. Um, okay. So how we got this thing. It's what, what did it do? Um, so essentially we want those, those weights. We want W and B, which are our betas basically. Okay. So anytime you have this model, it's going to have a, a, a member called layers. And it'll list all the layers that you constructed here. Here we have two layers. We have the input layer and the, the output layer, which is a dense layer. The input layer is boring, so that's that's layer zero. But layer one is our, our dense layer. So let's pick that up. That's the dense layer. Then we look at weights. Okay, so weights is that W. All right. Actually, no, weights is weights is W and B. Okay, so here I'm I'm saying that W is B beta hat. And B is going to enter for intercept. Okay. Now, when you just, let me work you through this. Okay. So let's just run this. Okay. And what does that give us? Okay. That gives us beta hat is this big hundred dimensional, uh, weird, not quite numpy array column vector thing. Okay. First you can see that it, it doesn't, it, it doesn't countenance one dimensional vectors. You gotta be at least two. And if you're one, it'll make you a column vector, which is a K, like a K by one. Okay, just how it works, all right? Um, now, <clears throat> it's also, you can see that 
it's a type TF variable. This is like a device variable because it can exist on a GPU or a CPU or like everywhere and nowhere at once. So it's got a lot of logic like built into this. So it's more than a NumPy array because it might have to be moved around. It might have to be moved onto the GPU or off the GPU, but it's a thing. Okay, and it looks a lot, it acts a lot like a NumPy array, NumPy array. Now, uh, then you can see it has the shape and also the D-type. One, one interesting thing is that this is using float theory. This is using single precision arithmetic, meaning it only has, you know, seven or so significant digits or eight, maybe probably eight, um, which is unusual for economics. But but it turns out that in ML, they that they don't care. It's just, it's faster, it's smaller, and they don't need more than eight digits. You know, why, I don't know, why do we need eight digits? Have you ever made a decision that depended on the eighth digit of any number? I don't think so. Um, so I'm fine with that. Uh, you can convert it to a NumPy array with the dot NumPy. Now it's just a NumPy array. It's still a column vector, which is annoying. So let's, let's flatten it. That's what I do up there too. So now you got truly, in all its glory, the beta vector. All right, and you can see it. It looks like we, how we construct it going from zero to one. So what I'm doing up here is I'm going to define the beta error, which is take that you know, numpy flatten routine with beta hat, subtract off the true beta. So this is the error in the estimate. And then I'm going to print out that stuff. Actually, I'm not going to print out the whole thing. I'm just going to print out the value of the intercept. Intercept is just one number. But we convert it to numpy and look at the zeroth element. And then we're looking at the absolute average beta error. Okay, so you can see the intercept should be zero. We didn't have an inter the true intercept is zero. That's pretty close. Uh, the mean abs average error, mean absolute error for the betas is quite small compared to the, the value of betas. Okay. Um, you could also, well, that's, that's what I'm doing here. That's not what I'm doing here. I mean, you, you could, you could plot, uh, um, true beta scatter plot of true beta versus um, beta hat, but we have to numpy flatten it. You can do this and you can see it's a diagonal line. Uh, when I'm really doing high frequency trading, you know, be calling those eight decimals arbitrage opportunities. Interesting point. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe you could, yeah, I wonder if that's a thing. Because I know there's the, the time frequency arbitrage. You just get to the market with the info faster. You've got your colo location in some basement in Hoboken and you just fire it over. Um, or, uh, yeah, decimal. But you know what? They have a limited precision on prices. I think you can only go to... I forget what it is, but there, there's definitely, I mean, it has to be, right? You need to communicate it in some format. There, there's a limited precision on, on prices. Uh, trading price numerical precision. There's a rule change. I think they, they are they, I wonder if they just keep increasing the number of precision so these guys can keep like trading on all this, like really, Minute stuff. One Chicago believes that two decimal pricing is not sufficient to translate a dollar value to an interest rate with precision. So they're they're apparently in Chicago, maybe in the board of trade, they have a two decimal precision. Pennies, not enough apparently. Um, I guess if you're create if you're doing, they're saying like if you're calculating an interest rate based on that, like when you run it through a nonlinear mapping or even a linear one, then you then all of a sudden it becomes important. I don't know. I'm yeah. Yeah, so office space they they round and give the remainder to themselves, but then they rounded wrong. They probably rounded to like the next dollar rather than the next penny. And yeah, I think that was it. Um That was a fun movie. Um okay, so all right, so that's that. Yeah. That that's the precision we got. All right. Um, you can also see straight line, identity line, basically, uh, mostly kind of tapers off here, but yeah. So it does a pretty good job. Okay. Um, and then if you look at the actual predictions, okay. So you want to predict stuff too, right? You, you 
you, you've estimated this model. You may as well do something. Actually, what we're going to do is just predict on the same exact X that we trained on, which is a little bit silly. But um, so we predict, you model that predict. This will predict those actual Y values from the X. Okay, I'm going to give it the whole X matrix. And I think when I do this, it actually reverts back to the CPU because the GPU has got, um, well, it's only got two gigs of RAM, whereas I got 64 gigs on this computer. So I think it reverts back to CPU and it takes a minute, but um, it'll predict that. And then I'm going to plot the uh, scatter plot. So this is that Seaborn scatter plot, the joint plot, which is pretty good. Um, plot the true Y value versus the uh, error prediction error, Y epsilon hat, basically, or Y prediction minus Y. Okay. And I'm going to do like a hex bin sort of thing. That's going to take a second. Oh, there we go. Okay. So you can see the way I like joint plot because you get these marginal distributions on like the appropriate axis and then you get a hex bin in here. Okay. And the hex bin is good because if you have a scatter where it's like everything is like in here, you can still see instead of just seeing like a dot here, you see like the, the actual distribution here. We get this eerie sort of black hole halo thing going on here. Um, but what you can see is that Roughly speaking, there's a little bit of, of ellipsoid action maybe in this dimension, but roughly speaking, the, the error is not correlated with the true Y value. And the error is much smaller. You can see this axis for the error is much smaller than this axis. It's probably some function of the <clears throat> this, the epsilons, basically, right? So, um, yeah, I mean, we could plot this versus the versus their epsilon, maybe. That's epsilon, oops, epsilon versus epsilon hat. Um, okay, oh yeah, I, mean, I guess y, y minus y predicted is actually epsilon hat. Okay, so, uh, so straight line. Okay, so it means we did pretty well. Um, okay, but I'm gonna bring this back so I can save this. All right, so that's what we get there. All right, um, seems like a good. Uh, SNS, that's Seaborn. That's this here, import Seaborn as SNS. It's just a, it's a, it's a high-level wrapper around uh, uh, Matplotlib. Um, some, sometimes it's sim it has more similar functionality to uh, R, like a ggplot sort of thing, because you can do, like, you can give it, like, facets and, like, tell it to color things based on certain columns and stuff. So it's, it's cool because you give it a data frame and then do stuff on that, okay? Um, so it, it's, it's got a couple, like facet grid kind of things too that that are that are pretty good. So okay, so that's linear regression. Um let's do logistic regression. This is gonna be similar. Okay, so it's it's gonna be going through similar steps. Okay, we're gonna use the same data size and everything. Okay, and then here uh we just gotta be careful. The betas are the same actually we can make them the same. X's you can make those the same. Now Z the error process is different though. So here we're saying Calculate Z is like our, our logit probabilities or log logit or whatever, uh, which is just X beta. And then we want to map that into a probability, right? And to do that, we're going to use this logit function. Okay. Well, this is, no, th this is like e, e to the X over one plus E to the X or equivalently one over one plus E to the minus X. Okay. Um, using machine, it, it's a bit overkill. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, so this is going to be our probability. Um, and then we'll, so this is going to get, this is going to give us a big list of a million numbers between zero and one. Okay. Now what we want to do is, well, we need actual realizations. Okay. So the realization is really just, this is the probability. You just look at is a random uniform less than that probability, right? So if the probability was one, the random uniform would almost certainly be less than one. Okay. Uh, and if probably was zero, it would be almost certainly greater than zero or less. Wait, did I do it backwards? Let me think. The probability is one. Yeah. And if it was zero, it would almost certainly not be less than zero. So it would come out with zero. Okay. So this is going to give you sort of the, the realization of that, like, well, I guess we Bernoulli random variable. Okay. Um, that's a zero. That's a, actually, that's a Boolean array. It's an, a NumPy array of type boolean okay or bool um it turns out first of all we want to make that at least into an integer 
okay? Because uh, TensorFlow doesn't really like bools. It, you at least have an integer. If you can do it, a float is best, okay? Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is that it doesn't even, if you're doing this, it, if you're doing this binary classification, this is basically binary classification, it really wants to, it really wants to think about its two categories, zero and one, and, and hence it'll want to have a, a two column vector, which is going to sum to one, which is going to be either zero, one or one, zero. And that's what, that, that's what this two categorical, this two categorical function will take any categorical thing could be a list of integers and it'll create, it'll look at the, the largest or the, the set of unique integers and create that number of columns. So if you're doing digits zero through nine, it would create a 10 with 10 array with a million uh, rows. Um, here we only have zero and one, so it's going to create a, a million by two. Okay. And that's going to be Y. Okay. So if you want to, it'll take a second. So if you just look at Y, it's just a bunch of those. And like, it's not always, um, it does vary also. It's not always just happened to be all on the right side there. Okay. Um, yeah. You can do like mean axis equals one. It's half and half. Or no, we should do axis equals zero. It's half and half there too. Okay. Not quite, but close enough. Um, it's half and half because these are, these X's were random around zero and it's totally symmetric. So it should be half and half. All right. Um, okay, now we need to construct the network. So let's, let me put in that summary stuff. I, I forgot to do that. So we're going to run this, but we also want to do model that summary and then we'll postpone the fit action until until next cell. Okay. So same thing input, same K dimensional vector. All right. And then, uh, the output, well, we want, now we want it to be two dimensional outputs for one, okay? And uh, we want this softmax. So the softmax is where um, you ensure that it's between zero and one. So, so if we didn't have softmax as the activation, we just have potentially positive or negative numbers or whatever. We want to run it through that e to the x over sum of e to the x function that I, that I wrote before. And that's what softmax is doing here. Okay, so this is ensuring that it's between zero and one and it sums to one, which is to say it's it's these probabilities here. It's these like looks like these probabilities. Same thing, we call it on the input layer and that gives us our output layer. We construct the model object, giving it that inputs there and outputs there. Something. It's not very loud Korean television show. One second. Okay, also a rice cooker somehow. All right, so uh, we got those inputs. It turns out it was a Korean person, not a television show. Um, we got inputs, outputs, okay, and uh, put that in the model, all right, and then we're gonna compile it, okay. And optimizer, still the favorite RMS prop. Loss, so now the loss is categorical cross entropy. This is that logit thing I derived last time. There's also a thing that says binary cross entropy. Okay. And that's, um, it's just the same thing, but for two categories, you can do this for binary and it, it doesn't care. Okay. So I just may as well give it categorical. Um, and then the metric is accuracy. So this is, this is, does the predicted output equal the predicted, or does the predicted output equal the true output? Okay regardless of whether it's zero or one, it's just like, does it equal that? Okay. Um, you can also look at like the confusion matrix, which is like, if true is zero, what's the fraction that are true or false and so on, like the four, the two by two. Uh, but this is just like the diagonal, the mean of that diagonals elements of that matrix. Okay. So, um, yeah. And, and it's, a, you know, but one thing you want to note is that truly output, let's see. Output gives you two numbers between zero and one. That's something one. They give you probabilities, right? So the accuracy, what it's really doing is it's looking at the the 
maximal, the best prediction. So whether the probability of being one is greater or less than a half, basically. So it's looking at the best prediction and then comparing to that to the true Y because the true Y's are, are zero one. It's creating zero ones from just like the best predicted uh, value from the, the neural network itself. Okay. So let's do that. You get basically the same thing, except um, we're mapping into the probability of being zero and the probability of being one, which is a little redundant, but it's just like, it, it doesn't like, it, it just likes doing it like that for some reason. Okay. So you have to, you have to fit into this categorical classification scheme that they've constructed. Okay. So you do that and then we're going to fit it. How much can you guys hear like a steam noise right now? Like a lot or a little, I do have, I think some noise suppression, but I'm not sure if it's good enough to overcome a rice cooker in the other room going at whatever it does, presumably cooking rice. Not at all. Okay. So my, my OBS studio, uh, is, is really doing its thing with whatever free transform windowing action it's got on the, the noise suppression. Okay. That's good to know. Um, okay. Uh, cool. All right. Excellent. Technology is working. Um, okay. So we're almost done estimating here. Boom. All right. So we got 90% accuracy. It seems to have converged. Okay. And then we're going to do the same thing, basically extract those weights. Now here, it, it, it's actually is a little confusing because it's like, what is the way? Because we didn't quite get to run the logistic regression that we wanted because we had to output two numbers. But if you think about it, if you look at the difference between like the zero weights and the one weights, if you work out the algebra, they should be what we get, what we, the true parameters. Okay. And in fact, they're pretty close. So if you do a scatter of beta versus predicted beta, again, you get that, that, that uh, identity line. Okay. You just had to look at the difference, the way this, this works, that, that gives you the, the true number. Okay. Um, okay. So that's, yeah, that's sort of 1.0 on neural networks. Okay. Um, I guess we can, we can take a break here, all right. And reconvene in, in about 10 to 10 and a half minutes, uh, or alternatively at, at, at 440. Okay. Um, and then pick it up after that. Next up is like, we're really amping it up. We're going to do some text classification. Getting pretty heavy. Maybe, I don't know, we could do image classification if you want. Um, uh, and then also I want to talk about GX a little bit, which is this other sort of TensorFlow related library. Okay, so let's do that. Get back here around uh, 440 in, in about 10 minutes. Okay, see you then.
Hey. What's up? Yeah, so. Let's fire this up. Uh, okay, we're going to pick up where we left off. We're going to do some of that text classification. Um, this, I don't know, I needed, I needed like some text classification task. Uh, so I figured I'd work with the patent data since I've got that on my computer here. Um, and then go from there. Okay, so... Uh, Yeah, let's let's before we do that though, let's um, head over to the uh, whiteboard. Okay, so um, so we want to do some text classification. Ah, what do we do for between the linear regression, telecast estimation parameters? Yeah, so um, let's let's look at that. So we go here. So the only difference um, there, so there are two differences basically. One is how we we get that output okay so, so the one thing is like we need to to send it to two outputs okay all right well this will it'll be on youtube when i when i well, it should be on twitch like right after so if you miss it i think go back but um the 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 main thing is so we got this two output thing. That's that's a little bit of a red herring. I mean, that's just like we could have one output if like there's a way to do it. You need to be a little bit tricky, but we we have two outputs. The the, the main thing is the softmax. Okay, so this is saying we're we're instead of going from any to any real number, we're constrained. We're we're running that through a sigmoid function, so it's only going to go from zero to one. So that's a probability. Okay, and the other thing is that here instead of mean squared error for the loss, now we're doing categorical cross entropy. Okay, so we're using that different likelihood basically and also that different output that we feed so that it's it's the right thing to put into the likelihood. Okay. Um yeah, so that that's the basic difference. Everything after that um in terms of the estimation is the same and then the and the other thing is uh yeah uh, the other thing is just generating the data. You know, we want to generate <clears throat> binary outcomes too. Okay. All right. So the um, whiteboard here. So yeah. So we want to we want to work with text data here. Um, so there's a couple of different ways to do this actually. There's, well, there's two different ways to do this. Okay. When, when, when working with this kind of text data. Okay. Um, so what we did the last time, okay. Was that, uh, in SK learn was that uh, bag of words approach where we ignore word order. Um, and we just get word frequency vectors. For each document, we get a word frequency vectors vector. Okay, so that's usually going to be pretty high dimensional. It'll be <clears throat> maybe a million dimensions. Okay, so k is on on the order of a million. Okay, um, that's a lot. Uh, it's a lot, and carrot. So so that and it generates a sparse representation remember that generates that sparse vector um i think keras can actually take in sparse vectors it's a little bit tricky um i, I did it a few months ago i haven't done it recently but it, it can take in sparse vectors it's just it, it doesn't always work great i think um but it can do that okay so you can you could do that you could feed in these things and essentially um what you do i mean for the for this one you're just feeding in a huge vector um and if you just have like a multi-layer neural network or NN, uh, if you have a multi-layer neural network, you could do, for instance, a classification thing. Okay, so so like the example that we're going to do here is uh, patent text it could be the title. I'm going to do the title just because it's a little shorter or the abstract. Um, and then we're going to map that into like a citation outcome. So basically, I want to predict like from the text is it get a, is it going to get a lot of citations, okay? 
um this is like on the the road to like a a more nuanced or or, or like nor more informative kind of approach where you would you would try and predict citations from patent text but like kind of conditioning on the, the class of technology okay so because it might just be that computer patents get more citations in general so you want to control for stuff but basically um you could imagine doing that okay but but we'll just do the the straight up unconditional uh predict citations um from patent text and in fact what we're gonna we're, what we're actually gonna do is is go from patent title just because it's 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 less data but you could do abstract too to uh citations being uh greater than 10 okay so it's like is it a good is it like a right actually it's 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 greater than like the median i forgot what the median actually is it might be around 10 okay uh so is it, is it an above average or above median um the patent in terms of number of citations and predicting that from the text of the title okay um okay so you could you, you you know at the end of the day you're you're doing a binary classification um are there any rules for patent names i don't know if you can have profanity in a patent name and uh the length i could tell you the average length so that's probably something good to know so like um so if we look at so this I, I load it in the it takes a, a minute or two to load in the patent text, but I loaded it in. And uh so here's a bunch of stuff. Use of five methyl hep two and four one as a fragrance. So it's like perfume probably. Uh so if we look at uh this here and describe the length, so um here's string, find the length for each string, and then describe that series of lengths. So then the median is uh, 49. So this is in terms of characters, actually. So it's kind of surprising. The mean is 53 characters. All right. Um, oh, yeah. So the mean is, it, this This is, look at the patent title. So we're saying in this data frame, this has the patent title. And then uh, you can access th this string accessor. It's like, if it's a string, you get extra functions. Like, you can call len on uh, every individual string in the series, okay? And then describe that. So, so let me just show you, like the original object is just the, the, the series of titles, okay? Just random stuff. Um, then if you do this str dot string dot len, that'll give you the length of each one. And then we're gonna describe that. So this is just like a quick rundown, median, mean, all that stuff. Okay, so this is the number of characters. If you think the average word is about six, then it's like, it, you know, it's like nine or 10 words. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, you could also do like apply, uh, actually, no, do this. We just wanna get the length, so we're gonna do this. S -L -N. Gonna take a second, but this is gonna split into words, find the length, and then look at those statistics. And so it's like average one is like seven words long. The median one is seven words long, and the mean is 7.3. Okay, so that's they're pretty short actually. Um so <clears throat> yeah, so that's what we're looking at here. Okay. Um now okay, let me go back to the to the uh the whiteboard so so we're mapping those titles into like this object is it above median citation so it's a classification thing you could do poisson too and just get the, the actually predict the number of citations but it's like i don't know it wasn't working as well so i just went for the classification stuff usually is like it'll usually kind of work um why i mean i don't know you you could have Certain, I mean, it, it could just be picking up types of technology. Certain types of technology are more or less likely to be cited. Um, that's pretty much what you'd, you'd expect it to be picking up. Um, and then I guess the other thing is, I mean, you, you could also potentially find, so you're going to be picking up terms that are associated with, with high patenting rates. Maybe you could find combinations of terms also. Uh, so it's not really 
Depends spread out. Yeah, I mean, maybe that. Uh, that's also useful. Um, but I think, yeah, I mean, so, 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 but this, the, the, the problematic thing with this would be like, you know, certain terms are associated with certain eras in technological history, and you might have systematic time trends because there's just more patents and hence more citations. So you'd want it, you want to really, you would want to control for a couple of things first and then look at like a residual and then predict that, or actually use time and um, technology class as an additional predictor to control for it. Um, but in like inside the, the neural network. Okay. So that's a little bit, it's, it's certainly doable. It's a little bit trickier. Okay. Um, but you can, you can do stuff like that. That way you're, you're picking up the actual like words, at least conditional on, uh, time and, and industry. Right. Uh, and there, I, yeah, I don't know. It's just, this is open-ended, you know, uh, sort of like, so, so there really is no hypothesis in, in a strict sense other than you can predict can you predict stuff? I guess that's one question. Can you predict stuff at all? Um, what's the okay? Uh, oh, wait, sorry. So something like water gun would be patented as water gun or super soaker. Um, they'd probably say water gun. Yeah, yeah, it would, it would say water gun. Method for constructing a. Yeah, they would have some funny technical term for it. I bet, and I'm sure a super soaker, super soaker certainly has patents. Um. So I would be curious to see how they describe uh, how they describe that. I mean, that Google Patents is like really good. Uh, so the Super Soaker, you can't see this, but I'll I'll let you know what I find. Um, toy water gun system. Let's see, yeah, they got they got all sorts of diagrams. Um, So if you look at, like, yeah. So here, here's the Super Soaker bad toy water gun that can. So, th so this would say toy water gun system. I don't. Yeah, I mean, so it's like, yeah, it's not clear what you'd be picking up with this whole with this whole exercise. Actually, it'd be better if we did the the abstract. Just like it was taking a really long time, so I wanted to have something that wouldn't take too long. But the abstract would be a little bit better because you could get an idea of like the complexity, maybe how many different types of uh, different fields it's bringing in together or something like that. that that's kind of what I was thinking with, with the with the title. Sometimes those are pretty short. So, yeah. Um, maybe we can try and do the abstract in a second and see see if it if it pans out in finite time. Okay. Um, you also have images, you know. That's a thing. You could You could run stuff on images. I don't know what you'd find there. Or even what the the how how you would find stuff, but it's possible, right? Um, okay, so yeah, so that's let me let me go back to the the whiteboard. Um, so that but that, so so that's where we're that's our target. Okay, is is predicting is it a, is an above average patent? Okay, um, so so the one approach this is like approach number one you could do is back of words. You get these frequency vectors, run it through a multi layer neural network okay and then spit out some prediction okay um so that can be good it, it does ignore word order okay and that that might be a problem the other thing you can do is 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 more like an embedding approach it's called an embedding approach okay now here what you're doing is you are converting okay so you you, you take your whole corpus and you look at the uh, number of distinct words that appear in the corpus after after some pre-processing, okay? And let's say that's 10,000 words. That's a little bit of a low ball, but let's say it's 10,000 words, okay? Um, now each document, okay, is gonna be a series of words, okay? And now you assign each word an index, okay? And so then each document, once you map it through that index, is gonna be a series of index integers. Okay, like that. This would be like a length seven, I guess, document. Okay, and that's sort of beat up integer, but let's say it's five. Okay, it's gonna be a length seven document. Okay, the last one's 101. So um, you can convert all your documents into something like that. Okay, now <clears throat> this is this is a good start, right? Uh, and so you're gonna get your whole data set is gonna be, you know, 
let's say this is L, length L, okay, and then you're gonna have N documents, okay? So you have a big matrix of integers, okay? Now, that's your input that you're gonna, we can create that pretty easily with standard built-in functions. Um, then the next thing you wanna do is map this through an embedding. Okay, and what the embedding does is it embeds each of these words into uh, a relatively low dimensional space, okay? So let's say that uh, a d-dimensional embedding, okay? Here I'm using 60, 32 dimensional embedding. So I'm, I'm mapping each word gets mapped into a 32 dimensional vector space. Okay, so for the word, you know, toy in that super soaker example, that gets mapped into a 32 dimensional vector. That maybe it's near the word game, you know, maybe it's near other words that look similar and it's far away from the word, you know, uh, photovoltaic or something. Okay, so um, far away in the Euclidean sense. Okay, so 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 there's some mapping. Now remember, now this embedding, it's not just we didn't just make it up. Okay, it's got certain parameters, which I don't know. We'll just call them W again. Certain weights. Okay, so it's like um, it really, it's 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 just the uh, the number of parameters for the embedding is uh, so let's let's say that there there are W words. So um, W words in the sense that these integers can take uh, values from zero to W minus one. Okay, they're W unique words. So this embedding is gonna be size uh, W times D. So for each word, W, there's a D, D numbers associated with that word. So the whole embedding is gonna be size W times D. It takes care of how to map that through because it's not uh, it's not really like a standard linear algebra kind of thing, but it'll take care of the mapping, okay, automatically. So that's actually a lot because if, if W is 10,000 and the, the, the dimension of D is, is 32, it's going to be 320,000 parameters. So this is like a super complex transformation. So you want to have a lot of data. Um, we probably are underpowered in that dimension the way I'm doing it right now, but um, that's that's what this embedding does, okay? 32, I just decided that. It doesn't matter. I mean, it matters, but it, there's no clear guidance on that okay so um so like there's a standard uh this is this is what's called the custom embedding okay so this is an embedding that we're training ourselves so so, no, 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 so these this is a 32 dimensional real vector space right so every single word gets 32 real numbers associated with it up to eight decimal places so um but there are 10,000 words okay so it's again this big space that David can visualize easily. Uh, and then each word is some point in that space. Okay. Um, so like, yeah, but this, but this is a, a custom embedding in the sense that the position of each of those words is like a parameter for us. Okay. So it's a, it's a lot of parameters. Um, that can be problematic. I mean, obviously having that many parameters, it's hard to estimate them. Uh, the other thing you can do is, um, Computationally difficult to estimate and statistically difficult. The other thing you can do is using a use a pre-trained embedding. Okay, so there's a couple of different ones. I think Face, no, no, uh, Google has one that I think is called Bert or maybe Glove. No, Glove's another one. Google has Bert. Facebook has one called Fast Text. So Fast Text is uh, so the 32 numbers are a number of possible positions. They're um, they're just numbers. Yeah, I mean, it's not like there's each word gets classified into one of 32 bins, right? Because then it would only be 10,000 dimensional, right? You'd have a number for for each word corresponding to the bin, right? This is saying each word gets a full 32 numbers that characterize it. And that if words are similar, then they should have uh, similar Euclidean distance, basically. If they're similar for the purposes of predicting citations, in this case, they should have a they should have a low Euclidean distance with each other. Okay, so um, think about it like this: 
imagine that patents that get cited a lot use terms from disparate fields, okay? And so what the, the algorithm might do is, is actually get some understanding of the notion of a field and that these, these words are like kind of clustered together. And then when it looks at all the words in, in, in for a certain title at the same time, if you see high distances between all the words, then you decide, oh, this is a, it's a synthesizing patent. It's, it's a, you know, doing interdisciplinary breakthroughs or something, and it should have high citations. I don't know if that's true, but let's say that that was true. Then that's what, that's what it could do. So, it, so but it first has to understand the notion of technological similarity of these words, and then look at the, the high distance stuff, okay? You could also have the opposite where it's like doing interdisciplinary is bad because it's like no one reads it on either side. And so, so having a tightly clustered set of words is, is better, but either of those could be learned by the algorithm basically. Okay. So, um, um, well, you know, it's not, it's not like, um, it's, there's nothing constraining it to be something that we can necessarily interpret. Okay. If, if the algorithm works, it, it, it might be that we can go back and, and kind of interpret it. Like in this example, it's like, it's a map of a 32 dimensional space that maps out different classes of technology. Okay. So it's like, I mean, you know, think about like, let's just, let's just, let's just settle for two dimensions here. Okay. So if we were going into a 2d embedding, okay. Then, you know, you'd have toy, over here, game. Okay, and then you have like you know, uh, you know, CPU or whatever. That's probably not actually used that much. Uh, semiconductor. Okay, stuff like that. And then over here you have like plant, you got green plants. And then over here you have like, um, what's another thing? I don't know. Uh, you know, like phone, smartphone or something like that. Tel telephony. Okay, so maybe that's like these are kind of close and these are kind of close and whatever. You know, so like um, each of them is just a point there. Okay, and the, and the meaning, you, you can't necessarily say what the meaning is going to be ex ante. Okay, because th there's nothing constraining it. Okay, but but if, if the algorithm is to work, it may end up that what it, what it, what it sort of creates, it, it, you're basically creating a language here. It, it's creating an internal language. Okay. Uh, it may be what it creates is interpretable to us yeah. at, at, if we go and look at it ex post. Or it may be that it, it's useful to the algorithm, but we can't, we don't know how to interpret it. But, but even then it's like, that could be something that could be informative to a person. You know, if it found something and, and we could figure out how to interpret it, that, that might reveal something that we didn't know before. Okay. And that's, that's part of, that's sort of more on the interrogation side. Okay. Where you, you know, you train the algorithm you can get this, you can get these positions, right? Just like we got those weights from the layers, the betas before we can get the position of the word toy and the word game. Okay. And we can look at pairs of words that look similar. Okay. We can try and map out the space. We could embed that 32 dimensional space with PCA into a two dimensional space. Like we did with, uh, with, uh, Bill Shakespeare and, you know, analyze it like that. Okay. Um, and maybe we would discover something that that's useful. Okay. So it's, kind of, you know, putting the scientific method cart before the horse a little bit, but, you know, I think that ship has sailed in certain quarters. So, you know, it can be a way to, to really explore the data at the same time, you know? Um, yeah. And so like, so for instance, uh, so there's fast text. Okay. This is the text. This is the Facebook thing. Okay. It's the only Facebook product that I really use nowadays. Uh, and, um, <clears throat> they pre-train an embedding on Wikipedia. Okay. The, the way they do it is, um, they have what's called an auto encoder. Uh, like an auto encoder is like you map from like X to D with, with some, some so like Wikipedia, you map all Wikipedia, with some embedding into the dimension D and then you map it back with some inverse embedding. So other inverse embedding back to X and like try and get good predictive error. You're essentially like, 
You're like taking Wikipedia, like passing it through a very small hole, and then trying to recreate Wikipedia on the other side. Okay? And it's like a compression. So, so you have to compress it in a, a, a figuratively and, and literally you need to compress it down into a lower dimensional space to do that. And like by figuring out how to do that, you also sort of figure out the structure of words. Okay. So, so what, what, what they do is they, they train this autoencoder and, um, report that, that low dimensional representation that it used to, to perform this compression. Okay. Um, and that's what they give you. So they, they, they give you this thing and you just give it a word and it's like, Oh, that's the, here's a 300 dimensional vector. So they, their, their D is 300. So they give you a 300 dimensional vector for each word, and then you can just use that off the shelf. The good thing is that they trained it on all of Wikipedia, huge amount of computing resources were required. Um, and they, they do it beforehand so you don't have to do it. And it, all, and it brings in all of that meaning from Wikipedia, which is, which is a lot, you know, I mean, there's a lot going on there. Um, and you don't have to do all that work again. Okay. And then you can use it. So, so we could do that. We could pull in, we could use that pre-trained embedding for instance. Okay. Um, or we could train our own. Okay. So, so it's, it's, a uh, depends on the, the application, I think. So, um, so, but that's what, so that's what we do here, basically. So we map it from these integer length L integer into, uh, well, so, we, so we, we map it into, let's see, um, for each patent, we got L integers describing the title. Then um, we're going to map that into what? So we're going to map into L by D. Uh, real numbers, like you know, inside a computer, real numbers. Um, so, so we're gonna map that into L by D now. So, notice we had integers. Now we're in the number of words times that dimension D. Okay, so that's yeah. So if we have like you know, a hundred. Well, we don't have a hundred words. If we had ten words, right? And the D is a thirty-two. That would be three hundred twenty numbers describing that. Okay. So um, that's sort of step number one, okay? And then what we want to do, okay, is map from that into something. Into an, I mean, into a classification, basically, okay? So, uh, yeah, you know, we can do that. Um, and, and here's where we're going to start using what's called convolution, okay? So, uh, let's see, I should, so imagine, yeah, imagine that D was one for a second. It's just to make things easier. Okay. So if we imagine that D was one, so now, now we just basically, we mapped every word into a single real number, very simple game. Okay. Um, and then, so now our, you know, I'm going to draw like a box grid here. Yeah. There we go. Okay, so so this is like representing our word. So each of these is like a number. Okay, like x1, x2, x3, and so on. And this is for one document. So like one pad, one patent title. Okay. Um x5, x6, x8. Okay, so then we want to map this into a classification. Okay. Now we didn't do bag of words. We didn't throw away word order. Okay. So we may as well use word order. Okay. And we can look at like phrases and combinations of words. Okay. So what we're going to do, if, if we want to, if we want to use order information, what we're going to do is, is what's called convolution. Okay. Now, if you've ever used like Photoshop or whatever, you know, like when you blur an image, okay, that's actually convolution because you're taking each point and you look at like the average in the neighborhood around it and assign that average to a new point. That's what blurring is. Okay. And what characterizes that convolution in, in an image space is basically like a kernel, which says like, okay, take this weight from the middle cell, like the central cell for that pixel. And then take, you know, like, you know, like one over nine, like let's say each of these was one over nine. That would be like a straight up, you know, uniform uh, blur convolution. Okay. Or you could do like, take like 50% from here and then take like, you know, five over eight. That doesn't make sense. 
0.5, you know, one over 16 from each of these surrounding cells and 50% from here. So that would be more like a, a Gaussian blur kind of thing. Okay. But, but what you, the numbers that are in this kernel, this is like a kernel. Uh, they're a linear map. Okay. And that's, that's a convolution, that type of blurring. Okay. Um, if you want to do it here, you'd apply, you'd apply a kernel. Let's say we want to apply it to four. I mean, let's say, let's say we did like a, a small kernel here where we just said, okay, look at <clears throat> some function. Okay. Of, uh, the, the central cell, which is X four and the neighboring cell is X three and X five. Okay. So each of these would be a number. You do look at some function. Okay. So, so here, um, here's where you could pick up, like if you're, your words were similar technologically. Okay. You could look at like the difference. Okay. Um, between these, between like X three and X four and between X five and X and X four and see that, or you could look at words that were close by to, an, to one another. Okay. Um, yeah. And so you can kind of get an idea. Okay. So it's, it's kind of a nonlinear operation. So you need multiple layers, but you can kind of get an, get an idea of that. And then, so so what you do is you you apply this kernel to each point here. So so once you when you apply this kernel, you're going to get a new grid, okay? And like you need to worry about what are these. You can just set the edges to zero. So like when you're doing eight, you can pretend like this is zero, and that's zero, okay? So you're going to get a new grid of convolved stuff. So it's like your blurred image kind of or the analog, okay? And then you can work with that, okay? So what that lets you do is is use the order information and say, is this word next to another word? And does that mean something? Okay. Um, and then to, to, you also want to reduce the size of this whole thing, right? Cause this is D by L dimensions. This is hundreds of dimensions in our actual implementation. So you, the other thing you can do is like take the max over these, over like successive cells. Okay. To reduce it down to something smaller and smaller. And at the end, just have a fully connected network. Okay. So, so the idea, if you, if you want to use the image analogy, okay, the idea would be like you have an image and you you, you, cr you use these convolution kernels and they can do stuff like picking up a, a corner, okay? So you, you, let's say you have a convolution algorithm that picks up uh, top right corners and you go through and try and find those. And then you try and you have another one that picks up bottom right corners and you go through and find that, find those. And you could do that and then at the end kind of figure out, oh, are all these corners arranged in such a way that this is a rectangle or a square, okay? Um, and th so, so that's how you, you, you first do the convolution to pick out features and then you aggregate and compress it down into something smaller. And then at the end, you just sort of use all of that information to, to make a guess. Okay. Um, so, but, so, but the two major steps are convolution, which looks at like local structure. Okay. Pooling, which is you take maxes or averages and reduce this from a size like you know eight vector to like a size four by by looking at the average of of each pair okay and then maybe you do that multiple times until you get down to something small and at that point maybe you have like 10 vectors and you just do a fully connected dense network to a to an output which is a you know a zero zero one probability okay so um that's the idea it's it's, it's pretty much the same in this one dimensional word setting. Okay. Uh, as in the two dimensional image setting. Okay. The, 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 the concept is similar. Okay. Um, okay. Oh, also, man, did you hear that, that John Conway died recently speaking of a uh, game? You know, if you think about the cells like this, that's kind of like the game of life. I don't know if you've ever seen that. But the, so the game of life is like an update rule where you look at your your nine neighbors and if if you have no neighbors you die of loneliness and if you have too many neighbors you die of overcrowding but if you have just the right amount then you either stay alive or you create a new cell and then it creates all of these patterns on a grid like this. That was John Conway. He, I mean he did that to, to just know about a bunch of other stuff. Uh, but if you haven't seen the game of life you gotta check it out. It's very cool. Um, okay. So here we got the patents now, which one of these I ran this, 
apparently I didn't run this. I'm trying to piece together what I've run from these numbers. It would appear I have not run this. So let me go through it though. So, okay, this is the data directory that I'm using. Uh, L I'm saying is 50, the longest that, um, we got John Conway fan out there. Very nice. Um, so L I'm going to say is the longest that your title can be. That's probably, an over, that's probably overkill looking at it now. It's overkill, but let's just keep it like that. Um, B is the batch size still 128. And then W is the no total number of words that I'm, I'm letting it use. So there's actually like 50,000 distinct words, but I'm just going to use 10,000 most common words. Okay. Um, so that, okay, and then we're gonna load the patent data. So here I'm, I'm loading all the patent data, just the patent number, the title, and the number of patents that cite it, okay? I'm also I'm also gonna just randomly sample 500,000 of these, because I don't, this, you can do it with all of them, but I just don't want this to take forever, and 500,000 is still a good number of patents, okay? So um, that's gonna take a second here, but that's so that's just going to load all of that in okay and then what i'm going to do after that is just pull out the raw strings from the title okay so this is going to give me a data frame but I, I really just need a list of strings okay uh that's corpus okay then get the site values as like an MP, numpy array okay and then also look at is the site grade site value greater than the median number of citations and convert that to a categorical because we want to do this binary classification thing. So it's just binary classifying. Is it above median or below median citations? Okay. All right. So now here's where the, the pre-processing magic happens. Okay. So we're going to use this tokenizer. Okay. What this is going to do first is going to split it into words, like which are, which are tokens here. So it just splits it, get rid of any punctuation, split it by white space. Okay. And so that'll just give you a series of words. Okay. It will, it'll give you a series of integers, those integers that correspond to words. Okay. In the background, there's a dictionary. Okay. Now, and we're going to fit it. So to f when it, the, so first you create it and say, okay, I want to do this thing and only use W words as a max. Then you say, okay, fit. This means find the vocabulary. So go through and find every distinct word, find the 10,000 most common, make that your vocabulary. That's fit. Just like before the fit transform stuff. And then text the sequence, this is the transform step where you actually convert that specific corpus to uh, vectors, okay, integer vectors in this case. Um, and then the last step is uh, you uh, pad the sequences, right? So it's in general, the titles are like, you know, they're like 10 words long or something. And I'm saying they can be up to 50 and, and you, need, you need to have a proper matrix to give the tensor flow. So you just pad it to the most and the rest are just zeros, which are like not interesting. Okay. So zero is like by default, not interesting. Okay. And then, um, you also truncate them if needed, but in this case it's not. So, um, okay. So that's, that's what we got there. That's, so now we have essentially high site is our output. Okay. And then vex is our input. Vex is a, is a list of integers. Okay. Now, now we need to make the network. Okay, we have the data, we need to make the network. Okay, so the first one is similar. Okay, we're gonna take this input, which is of length L. So this is a, the each input row is L integers corresponding to the, the words in that title, truncated by potentially a lot of zeros. Okay, uh, embed, so embedding, this is the embedding magic. So we're saying use this embedding the output, or say the, the the input is going to be potentially W dimensional in the sense that it could be up to 10,000 words, W equals 10,000, okay? Um, and the output is going to be uh, 32 dimensional, okay? Because part of the thing is like the way that TensorFlow thinks about these integer vectors internally is actually what's called the one hot vector. So if you had the integer was five, it would actually look at it as zero, 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 one, and then 999,000 zeros after that, or whatever, 9,995 zeros after that. So, um, so that's kind of like the dimensionality of the, the one hot vector. Okay. And this is the output vector, 32 dimensional embedding. Um, and the input length is the, the, the number of words that we have. L. okay. Call that our input, okay? 
okay now so now we've we've got it to that that intermediate you know embedding 32 dimensional thing so it's 32 by l okay now and this, this in fact the summary is accurate so we'll just reference this okay so we the input was some stuff uh, n basically whatever that is by 50 50 words and these are integers then the embedding brings it 50, for each word we have a 32 dimensional number so it's 50 by 32 and you can see there are 10,000 words mapping into a 32 dimensional uh, vector space so that that means this embedding has 320,000 parameters which is a lot okay um, okay now now that's a lot and this this thing here is huge you know this is uh, 1600 numbers for each patent describing in great detail what it's up to okay um, so we need to reduce that okay so one thing you could do is create a dense layer that mapped from 1600 numbers into uh, one number and that would only have 1600 parameters which wouldn't be that bad honestly um, I say map into two, so it'd have 3,200 parameters. It wouldn't be that bad, honestly. Uh, the thing is that the convolution is is not just for compression, but it's also to, to pick up spatial relationships, spatial in the sense of where you are in the sentence, okay? So it's still useful to do convolution. Um, so the convolution here is we're going to look at... Uh, let me think. 8, 4, what does that mean? Um... Uh, the numbers are, ah, yeah, filters and kernel size. Okay. I just need to get like, which was which. Okay. So eight filters. Okay. It's first the kernel size. This is that window that I was, that we were looking at that window here. Like how many, I can't reach over there. Um, how many, uh, here in the, the example over there, it's two windows. The window sizes, I guess would be one. Okay. Cause you're looking one to the left and one to the right. Okay, here we're saying we're looking four to the left and four to the right. Okay, that's probably too big actually. Let's make that smaller. Let's only look, let's just look like one on each side. Okay, um, let's do two on each side. So so now we're looking two to the left, two to the right. Okay, which for you would be also, oh, it's, it's mirrored twice, right? So two to the left, two to the right. Um, so then, uh, and the eight filters, what does that mean? That means we have, Remember I talked about picking up a oh, top right corner or bottom right, left corner, bottom right, top left corner. Those are different filters because they're looking for different things. Here's the same idea. We're, we're, are we looking for similar words? Are we looking for different words? Are we looking for words in a particular domain? Okay. So that's what we're doing. And we're, we're doing eight of those. Okay. So that's the convolution, bringing that spatial structure and using it. Um, and then the, the pooling, we're doing max pooling. So you do those convolutions and then you do max pooling over like, blocks of four words okay and what that does is um it it's like if you did that that top right corner filter convolution it just looks like did you find a top right corner in that area that's what the max pooling is saying did you find anything there Okay, because maybe it's a slightly different, you know, positioning and, and that could throw it off. So you just do max pooling. Okay. Yeah. Um, so this is like, did you find something related to toys in the beginning of the sentence, for instance? Okay. And then you can compare that later on to the end of the sentence. Okay. Um, okay. So we do that. So the convolution, um, the convolution. So we looked at, eight filters. Okay. So that would be the output there, eight filters. And then we looked at, um, essentially, let me get this straight. Okay. So the reason that this goes down to 47 is because we're, we're losing 
sorry, I'm actually pointing at this, but I can point here. The reason it goes down to 47 is that we lose the edges when we do the convolution. Okay, I think you can actually change that, but um, you lose the edges. Okay, so here you can see we go from 50, you know, words, each 32 dimensions. We lose the edges on the convolution. That's why it goes down to 47, okay? And for each of those, we get eight filters, okay? So the convolution is looking um, sideways, okay, across different words, but also across those word vectors too at the same time. So it's bringing all, so it should be like uh, something like five times 32. So this is saying, I don't know why it's, I would have expected five by 32, but maybe I'm, I'm missing something. Five, five times 32 is, is not, that's like, you know, 160. Um, yeah, maybe missing them. But so you bring in the convolution, then the, the max pooling, okay, that breaks it into chunks of like, in this case, four. So it should reduce it by roughly a factor of four, okay, which is modulo four. This is, this is that factor of four, okay. Um, and then you flatten it. Okay, so now you have like for each block and each type of filter, like bottom right corner of a square, uh, you have that max pooling number. And then you just flatten that all out and aggregate it into to one final output. Okay, so um, yeah, and that's what you get. All right. Um, and you know what? Let's, let's throw... Let's throw another layer. We're going to call that intermediate layer. And that's going to be of size 32. Okay, and it's going to be ReLU unit. When you throw in multiple layers, you allow for more nonlinearity. Okay, so, so having one extra layer allows you for like quadratic terms, basically, and I think an interaction terms especially, which is, which is very important. So let's do that. And this is going to go on enter. Okay. All right, so let's do that. Okay, so we just threw in another layer. So now we have that flattened layer, 96, okay, um, and so on. Okay. Uh, yeah, now this makes more sense. This is this is 32 times something, okay? Um, and then we added an extra layer here once we flattened, and then we output to dimension 2. Okay, and you can see the number of parameters for each. Most of the parameters exist inside that embedding. Okay, and you can see the total number of parameters is about 323,000, which we only have 500,000 data points, so it's kind of a lot. But we have available to us about 7 to 8 million patents, so it's just I didn't want to, to run through it. Okay, so let's do this. Let me see how long did this take last time. We could probably get away with it. Let's just do, let's just do 10. We don't have all day. Okay, so um, we're going to do 10 epics batch size B mapping from VEX into high site. Okay. Only other thing here that we're throwing in is what just happened. Now we've gone recursive. My God. Oh, and it takes like each level of recursion has to like go through streaming to Twitch and back again. So it like builds up and in indicative of the lag. Nonetheless, um that happens sometimes let me just uh i just need to switch what i'm looking at back to jupiter lab no more recursion okay so um yeah so the, the last thing we're doing is this validation split so the training validation i forgot to talk about that but basically you train on 80 percent of the data and then you use that out of sample 20 percent to make sure you're not overfitting because overfitting is a big problem okay so now we're doing that Okay, this is going to take a minute or two. Um, in the meantime, okay, as, while that works on, on estimating, um, there's only one other thing I really want to say, which is about overfitting, okay? So with overfitting, doing this validation thing can tell you if you're overfitting, but it can't protect, it can't prevent you from overfitting, okay? Um, so how do you prevent yourself from overfitting? Well, don't put in too many parameters is one thing. Use a lot of data is another thing. But even then, you might you might still have problems, okay? The last thing, this is the Jeff Hinton magic that I was talking about before. is called dropout, 
you just throw in a dropout layer. And what it does, it just kind of randomly flicks on and off these connections, okay? And by, by like inducing that kind of what's sort of like risk to it, you kind of have to diversify, okay? Um, just want to make sure that this gets all the way there. You kind of have to diversify, okay? And so you don't rely too much on particular features or particular data points, okay? You 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 rely on something more broad based, okay? So there's there's a sense in which it's like a risk diversification way you can think about it, but basically by doing that sort of random severing with drop the dropout layer, you you, you prevent it from overfitting too much, okay? So that's it's actually really quite useful, okay? Um, so here you can see. Uh, you can see the loss, and in particular the accuracy, right? So the accuracy here is going up. If you look at the validation accuracy, it's not actually going up. So, yeah. Um, this seems to be mostly overfitting. Okay. Um, and, uh, I mean, you'd think that half are above median and half are below median. So I'm trying to decide whether 60% is even good at all. Okay, 60% accuracy, that means you're predicting it accurately 60% of the time. The thing is, if if something is always, if something was true 60% of the time and you always guess true, you'd get 60% accuracy, right? So accuracy has to be interpreted in the context of how often the thing is true or how often it's false, okay? Um, it's not necessarily that 50% above 50% is good. Okay. But here you can see it, it actually is basically just overfitting this training accuracy goes up and validation accuracy kind of goes down slightly. Okay. So that's problematic. Okay. Um, you could throw in dropout. Let's, I don't know if dropout will help. Let me also add in this intermediate layer. Um, yeah, I don't know if I'm not sure if dropout would help here, but maybe it will. So I'm going to add in another dropout layer there. So this is dropout. That's flat. This is drop. It's going to be enter. So we drop one. So we enter. Okay, kind of going fast here. Drop one and then output. Okay, so essentially the lesson here is we, the training seemed to be going well, but the validation accuracy was not good. And if that's the case, well, you're not doing very well. Okay. Um, now let's see what happens with dropout. Nothing. Because you get some cryptic error message. I think I know why. Uh, yeah, should be 32. Should be 2. Should be soft max, and that should be ReLU. Okay. So now we're doing the same thing. You train at the end of the epic, you test the validation uh, metrics and see how they do. Okay. I don't know, we're, we're basically out of time here. Okay. So, all right. Um, So far, so good. Let's see how it, it moves around over time. <clears throat> yeah, the, the car I like the Keras interface too. It's got this slick progress bar. I would call it slick. Um, yeah, you know, I think the dropout's going to prevent some overfitting. It can't prevent all overfitting, but I think it's gonna it's going to prevent some of it. But the thing is that like, so in this case, you basically can't predict that much, I think is, is the takeaway. And what dropout does is just ensures that you don't predict much on the training side either. Okay. In addition to the validation. So you, you like get the right answer, but the answer is like, no, you can't predict anything. Okay. So yeah, I mean, it's kind of a bummer, but you know, um, yeah, so if you look at the comparison, the side by side comparison in, in Epic Four, you were get you're getting sixty one point five, and whereas in Epic Four here you're getting sixty 
for. So it, it, it blunts the overfitting. It will not eliminate it entirely, but it does blunt it. Okay. And you can see in either case, we're not doing great on, on uh, validation. Okay. So that's, that's kind of the takeaway. All right. Um, but I think I, dropout is very good. I would definitely make use of that if you're, if you're doing serious stuff. Okay. Um, because in the case where you do get more predictive accuracy in the, in the, the validation side, it means your training stuff is better too. Okay. Um, cause it pre prevents some overfitting. All right. Um, okay. So that's, I think that's pretty much all I got. Um, for now. Okay. I don't know if we're having class next week. I need to figure it out. I'm going to talk to Marla now. In fact, I'm going to talk to her five minutes ago. So, um, you guys got questions on the on battle royale let's do some zoom okay just let, just send me an email okay and we can set up time all right uh if you want to do it maybe we can pool things together a little bit uh and yeah so we can do that um and then i we may have class next week or we may do the presentation stuff we'll see uh i don't know okay so that's that's pretty much it for now though um you guys have a good weekend uh and relax. I don't know. Enjoy being quarantined. Um, we have proper time for office hours. Um, you want to do tomorrow? I mean, tomorrow, anytime tomorrow, basically. It's good for me. Let's um, accept 11 a.m. Like in the afternoon tomorrow, anything's good. Okay, so what do you, send me an email, okay? Like, I don't know, like two o'clock. Is two o'clock good? Oh, you have recitations. Uh, Hoogie, Hoogie, what's good? When are your recitations? You, you want to do later? uh about two to six okay um you want to do one you want to do one and then we can we can go from there class uh ends up with your class you want to why don't we do it after can you do after 115 I know it's kind of not a hundred percent ideal. Okay, so let's uh, let's let's start at one tomorrow. Okay, I'll I'll start at one. I mean, if anyone wants to come, uh, I'll start like one. We'll do like one to two. Okay, and then if you can't make it, then then let me let me know, um, and we can set something up. Okay. All right, cool. I'll write that down in my calendar, and uh, see you guys then. All right, thanks.